Hi everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. So I'm just going to get started right off the bat with this video. I will be sharing with you all my top 10 tips for how to choose the right university, the right college best for you. Um, for context, I am currently a graduate student um, at the University of North Texas. So I did my undergrad degree and now I'm in grad school on full scholarship for both degrees. So if you need help with scholarships, that's also what my content talks about. But anywho, for the sake of this video, let's just get started. So the very first tip I have for you is to stay up to date with the news that is taking place at your university. And so in order to do this, you can follow your university's um, Twitter accounts. You can follow the student-based journalism uh, club or school that they have because they should be up to date with what's going on throughout the university, whether that's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Typically they're on Twitter from my experience with my school. And make sure to also study up on how that specific university treated or is still treating their students uh, during the pandemic with COVID because some of these universities, mm, you probably should not be attending considering how they treated their students during a whole pandemic, just saying. Oh, that's strong. Okay, so the next thing that you really want to look for before considering going to a specific school is how good is that particular program that you're enrolling in, or specifically how competitive it is to get into. So as an example of this, I know someone who went to UT Austin, and they were trying to get into their school of engineering, I believe, over there. And so they got into UT Austin, but it was so competitive to get into their school of engineering. So they literally went two years of not being able to get in and delaying their graduation by like two oh years. So, you know, having to pay them more in tuition, which is crazy. And the same thing happened at my university of where this person was trying to get into the highly competitive graphic design program we have here. I didn't even know it was that competitive. But again, with him, he was trying for two years to get in. And because they only have like X amount of people that are allowed in per year, it was so hard. It wasn't that he wasn't good enough or anything. It was just too, too little of slots left. So make sure to study up on how competitive that particular program is and to set up like Zoom calls with those who are already enrolled in it and also Zoom calls with like the advisors or the dean over that specific part of the school. So the next tip I have relates to financial aid, which can make or break your college experience. So when you get your financial aid award letter from your university, just know that sometimes you can in fact negotiate how much money um, they give you. So like, let's say that you're this, you know, this very great student of where you got accepted into all these prestigious universities, different schools across the nation, and you're trying to make your decision. The only thing that will persuade you from not pursuing that particular university is that they're not giving you enough in grants and scholarships and all that. So yeah, I have a template linked in my bio description that you can download on how to appeal for financial aid. And also when you are deciding on a specific school, look into how many scholarships they offer for current college students. A lot of people, they stop applying for scholarships like their senior year of high school because they don't expect to get any while they're in college, but I want a whole bunch while as a current college student. So make sure to figure out and determine um, how likely you are to win those scholarships once you are eligible to even apply for them. Now, I will say that when it comes to appealing for financial aid and writing out like a letter to do so, it more so works at like state level schools, schools of where it is somewhat easier to get in, like they don't have um, like a long wait list of people because they're so very, very selective on who gets in, like, you know, those top tier, uh, tier one schools, Ivy Leagues, et cetera. So appealing for financial aid more so works for like state level schools, because at the end of the day, their main priority is more so getting their numbers up, meaning enrollment numbers up. So if you can 
write out a letter saying, hey, the only thing that's preventing me from enrolling at your institution is the fact that you're not giving me enough money, then they're more likely to try any means possible to ensure that you stay with them. Brief intermission here. I hope that this has been helpful so far. If you really want to increase your chances of winning scholarships, then consider enrolling in my online course, The Scholarship Algorithm. It gives you a step-by-step -step strategy on how to go about the overall scholarship process the most effective way possible, increasing your chances of winning by 10 times more. Here are some of the people who have won as a result of the course videos. Additionally, the course also comes with my book by the same title, The Scholarship Winning Likelihood Calculator, and my personalized services if you want to add that on too. See, if I had something like this back when I was a senior in high school, there is no doubt in my mind that I would have gotten a full ride scholarship right off the bat. No questions asked. And for those watching this video, you can get 25% off the basic master course with this promo code. Okay, now back to the main video. So as for the next tip, this relates to getting a job on campus or off campus, but specifically on campus. Um, look into the job opportunities that your specific university offers whether that's work study, non-work study. See, I personally think that schools are more likely to um, hire you if you are work study, because if you don't know the difference between work study and non-work study, work study is a way I believe like 80% of um, the pay that you will be receiving from that job is paid from the federal government. And then 20% of it would be paid by the actual institution, your university. Whereas non-work study outside of the FAFSA, FAFSA, however you pronounce that word, um, that money, non-work study is more so 100% of the university uh, paying for your, your payroll. So from their perspective, it would be a lot cheaper to hire someone who is work study as opposed to non-work study. So if you're filling out the FAFSA, FAFSA, whatever, um, make sure that you check that box that says work study. And if you have the option to get a job this work study, do it. Now, another great job to have as a college student is working for student housing. Um, for two years, I was an RA, a resident assistant. So at my particular university, that fully paid for my housing, my meal plan. And then I got like a monthly stipend of $400 per semester and all these other perks, right? And so it depends. Uh, like the perks for being an RA or an FA or an HA, FA is facility assistant, HA is housing ambassador. The perks differ from university to university. I at first thought every university has it set up of where you get your housing fully paid for plus your meal plan, but other schools, it might be like you only get 70, you get like a 70% off discount for housing and maybe one semester of your meal plan uh, paid for like again it differs from school to school so make sure that when you're creating like your excel spreadsheet or whatever uh, showing the pros and cons and comparisons between each individual school that you're interested in that you also take that into account if you are interested in being um, an RAHAFA and I can make a separate video and I can make a separate video about that so just let me know in the comment section if you're interested in learning how to become an RA because it is fairly competitive because you know a lot of people want their college housing and meal plan and all these other benefits paid for. So yeah. Some other job opportunities to look into as a college student would be like being a TA or an RA, meaning a teaching assistant or a research assistant. Now these positions are more so geared towards those who are enrolled in grad school. Sometimes they're also open to undergrad. Again, it depends on the university and how they operate and everything, but similar with, um, the position as an RA it comes with a lot of benefits, depending on the school, of course, like if you are a teaching assistant or research assistant at a particular university, it might just pay fully for your housing, it might just pay for both housing and tuition. Again, it all depends on that particular school and the perks that they offer. So now let's talk about housing, how to choose um, the right apartments, the right dorm, whatever it may be, if you have the opportunity to do an in-person tour of where you are thinking of living. And if they don't offer that, or perhaps the university is like too far away from where you currently live for you to just only visit just to tour, you know, the housing, um, you can do a virtual tour via FaceTime, Zoom, whatever it may be, and they just show you around the complex. And also given my past role as an RA, 
Um, when you're looking into housing, do not depend on just the tips and advice from those who work in housing because, you know, their job is to make sure that the facility looks as presentable as possible. Um, sometimes it is a lot better to seek advice from those who actually live there. So that might be of where you are going to YouTube and checking out vlog videos of move-in day for a particular dorm that you're interested in looking into or a particular apartment complex you're interested in living in, whatever it may be. Do not be too dependent on just the pictures or the videos provided on the website from your university. Because again, things can be Photoshopped. They try their best to make things look good because at the end of the day, their goal is to get your money. And also I will make a separate video on, again, how to become an RA as well as how to choose the right roommate because mm, I got stories for that one. And also just overall housing tips for apartments or dorms because there's so much that goes into it. And this video is not so much uh, dedicated to just that. So I'm gonna have a separate video for that. Okay, so the next thing you want to look oh, you want to look out for when choosing a particular university or college is proximity, proximity to home, proximity to your classes, proximity to um, student life, uh, nightlife, like the bars and all of that, whatever it may be. Um, because I have seen so many situations where people I know they get into their dream school, but it's like in the middle of nowhere. And there's nothing much to do. And it takes like a 30, 30 minute drive just to get to places of where they can really enjoy themselves outside of the context of their education and school. And also, I want for you to ask yourself this. Are you a homebody? Are you someone who would prefer to be fairly close to where your parents, where your, um, your childhood home is? So for me, I live like a little over an hour away from home. And so I can go there honestly anytime. And at first I was somewhat of a homebody. I would go there my freshman year, like every other weekend. But as I got older, I, I just loved having my own space and not having to do the chores that I did not cause in the first place. Like, why am I washing these dishes when I didn't do that? Anywho, make sure to take into account proximity. Because again, I know a lot of people where they were homebodies, but then they decide to go to a school that's across the nation and they're constantly missing their family. They're not really adapting well to the environment, the social environment of their school. And so they end up being miserable, transferring, dropping out and all that. So make sure to take that into account when you're choosing a school. And again, proximity or location also pertains to the particular dorm or apartment you choose to live in. So like, let's say you are a chemistry major and all of your or most of your classes are in the chemistry building, and you know that there is a certain apartment complex that's really close to it, well, it makes sense for you to choose to live at that apartment as opposed to one where you have to walk like a long distance or drive or take the bus, or perhaps let's say that you don't like your family. Well, in that case, it would be best to choose a school that's as far away as possible so that you have the excuse of you know not being able to afford a, a plane ride a plane ticket every single time just to visit them for each holiday season or whatever. Okay, so now let's get into social life. I'm giving you advice on this as someone with social anxiety. See, the very first semester is so crucial when it comes to forming social groups, networking, etc. So if you are someone who constantly just, you know, is in your room all the time like me, you're not going to have much of a social life. I'm just going to I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that right now. So you really need to go outside of your comfort zone, go outside of your box, um, and just get out. And so to get an idea of what the social life is like at your school, what the culture is like at your school, um, you can watch vlogs, day in the life videos of a Stanford student, day in the life videos of a UT Austin student. Look up those things on YouTube or perhaps even on TikTok and see what it's like and see whether or not you like it. It also helps to join Facebook groups or group me's if you can find them or even Discord chats and getting to know people that way. And this is also a great outlet for finding a roommate if you are in need of one. 
Another thing that you can do is researching online um, the clubs and organizations on campus that that school has and then following them on social media, seeing how active they are with their social media accounts. Typically, how active they are with their social media is also reflective of how active they are in person. I have learned this the hard way because there was one organization I try to be a part of, and the last time they updated their social media was like over a year ago. And then when I joined the organization, we literally only met like one or two times. So again, the more active they are with their social media, the more likely they are to be active in real life. Um, typically, from what I've seen, student-based organizations, they're more so active on Twitter. So make sure to follow their Twitter accounts primarily um, and also follow relevant hashtags related to that school, um, like the abbreviated form of their school and see what other people are saying. And again, reach out to people, DM people, ask them what the school's like, perhaps set up a short Zoom call, phone call, five to 15 minutes, just so you can get a legit up-to-date idea of what the school is like. Because let's say you reach out to someone who went to the school maybe over five years ago. Well, going to a school like five years ago, as opposed to today, can be totally different, especially taking into context how the pandemic has affected things. So make sure to get the most up-to-date information about the current climate and the current culture of that particular institution. Another thing you want to look out for when it comes to choosing a school is the temperature. So I live in Texas. It's pretty hot here a lot of times. I mean, right now, as I'm recording this video, it's kind of cold. But for the most part, it's like hot, not too cold. And I literally cannot see myself living in somewhere like the North, Northeast New York. I would not survive. I do not like the snow when we had a blackout. What was that last year in Texas? Um, I was freezing. And I, I actually have a traumatic experience with snow of where my brother, he left me in the park knowing that I'm directionally challenged. And it took me two hours to find my house when it was literally only a 10 minute walk. Anywho, I don't like the snow. And that's why I could not see myself enrolling in a school that was heavily snowed in all the time. So that's why I went ahead and just stayed in the South in my own state. Okay, so now let's talk about diversity and inclusion, which is so very important, especially if you are a minority such as myself. Now, when I talk about diversity and inclusion, I'm not just talking about like the diversity of the students, but also the diversity of the types of classes you can take, as well as the diversity of the staff and the faculty. So to give you an example of this, my school is classified as an MSI or HSI, so minority serving institution or Hispanic serving institution, but then our faculty and staff is like predominantly white. And so if you know anything about the research behind retention when it comes to um, school and performance of students, students tend to be much more likely to retain the information they learned if they are taught by someone who looks like them. Now, that's not to say that you can't properly learn from someone who's a totally different demographic from you, but that you are, in most cases, more likely to learn from someone who also looks like you. To give more context about this, so I have been at my institution for a little over, going into five years, because I went here for undergrad and now for grad school, and I have never had a Black professor. Well, I take that back. So I had two Black professors, but they were only virtual, so we never got you know, face-to-face -face, um, time in a classroom. All of my in-person professors have always been not like me. And so even though that has been the case, I was still able to get like a 4.0 with GPA and everything. But again, if you look at the data, some people really need to be represented in who they are being taught by. So if you know that you are that type of person, um, perhaps it would be better for you to attend institutions such as like an HBCU if you're black like me, and you really want to also be exposed to other black educators in that way. Now, as for the final tip I have for this video, it relates to size, the size of the overall school, the size of how many people are enrolled in the school and the size, average size of your main classes. So basically the professor to student ratio. Um, if there's a smaller ratio, 
if there's a smaller gap in the ratio between the student and the professor, then again, that helps with retention because studies have shown that less likely the student's retention is going to be higher because they have less access to one-on-one attention and all that. So yeah, make sure to take that into account because I don't want for you guys to be overwhelmed. Some of these campuses are huge. And if you are someone who is like claustrophobic or just overwhelmed by seeing too many bodies all at once, especially during a pandemic, you're going to kind of freak out like I did. So make sure to keep that in mind. Anywho, that's all for today's video. I hope that this was helpful. Make sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out the full playlist of all the other videos I have on here. Again, my content started out with scholarship advice. So if you need help with that, if you want to graduate debt-free like I did for undergrad and will again for grad school, then make sure to check out that playlist as well as the playlist on other college-related advice that I have for you. Bye.